I've come here to get a boulder off my chest. I have something that has been bothering me for quite some time now, and this is my way of coming to terms with it. This is my way of coming to terms with the devil that resides within me. I served in the military back in the 90s, and unfortunately, my term started just six months before the first Chechen war broke out. Out of training, I found myself on a plane to Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, about to face a mob of pissed-off former Soviet soldiers who called the city their home. Needless to say, being an infantryman during the Battle of Grozny was hell. We barely clawed our way to victory. I personally lost many friends, mostly because my platoon found itself in the territory of a particularly pesky sniper that kept picking our guys off left and right for a while. The skillfulness of people like this sniper earned the Chechen guerrilla fighters the nickname Spectres, because they just came, launched a surprise attack, and were gone by the time we managed to figure out what was going on. By the time we managed to figure him out, all the remaining guys in my platoon were so pissed at him that the matter was personal to us at this point. Once we had him in our sights, we broke all protocol. Instead of gunning him down like we should have done, I and some other guys made it our mission to get our hands on the guy and make him suffer as much as possible. Thus, one night, we stormed his home. It was a typical Soviet multi-story apartment complex. Once inside the building, we made as much ruckus as possible, shooting anyone in sight pretty much until we got to the sniper's apartment on the top floor. The whole apartment appeared to be redesigned as some sort of military base. I never got to ask, nor did I care at the time, but I guess he was either a warlord or someone close to one in the region. Anyway, I digress. After breaking through the front door guns blazing, and causing some old man in the apartment to clutch at his chest and fall dead on us. We proceeded to beat the living snot out of the people present in the apartment before taking the man himself hostage. Imagine seeing your kids get the absolute shit beaten out of them by a group of six soldiers in peak physical condition until they are almost dead for no reason. We did that. Imagine yourself seeing your wife get killed for no reason. We did that. We killed his wife in what I called self-defense, after she swung a kitchen knife at David. I believed that Kostya shot her in an attempt to defend our friend from a terrorist. She wasn't one, however. She was just a civilian caught in something that shouldn't have even happened. After seeing the brain matter of his wife get smeared all over the wall, the spectre snapped. He was swinging at us like a man possessed. Hell, he even managed to cut me across the face, just nearly missing my neck. No matter how many times we hit him, he just kept coming back for more. At first we planned to knock him out, and then take him out in the vehicle. But with his seemingly superhuman outburst, we resorted to shooting both of his legs to subdue him. Even after getting shot in both legs, he wouldn't shut up. So Vitalik put him to sleep, and we dragged his unconscious body to his car. We used his car to leave the city proper and drive into a forested area to carry on with our plan for the spectre. Getting past the separatist outposts was rather easy considering the fact that among us was Artur, a Dagestani who looked just like the locals and could speak Chechen. Once we found a secluded area far enough from human eyes, we unloaded the Chechen and tied his torso to a birch tree with one rope and his legs to the car's hitch with another. After looking around to make sure that we were truly alone, I took a piss on the Chechen to wake him up. He squirmed around in my piss while cursing at me in his tongue while I took care of my business. Once fully aware of his situation, the Chechen began screaming at us and struggling against his bonds. Artur told him in Chechen that he shouldn't resist, and the spectre retorted by calling him a traitor. I suppose 
As I remember Artur telling him he was Dagestani, I crouched next to the Chechen and told him I knew he understood Russian. Then I asked him if he knew who Prince Igor was. In response to my question, he spat in my face. The boys wanted to beat the shit out of him for that, but I stopped them. Instead, I opted to tell him about Prince Igor's demise. I looked the Chechen in the eyes and told him that every year during his reign, Igor of Kiev made his way to the capital of the Drevlians, Iskorosten, to collect tribute. I told him this process went fine until one year. After already collecting his annual tribute, Igor had a change of heart and decided to try to drain some more money out of the Drevlians. He had sent most of his force back home and left for the tribe's capital with a small force of a few dozen men. The locals found out about this and relayed the message to their prince, Mal, a man of short stature and high ambition. In response, Mal raised an army and confronted Igor's envoy. He slaughtered Igor's men and captured the prince. The Chechen just cursed at me up to this point, probably not even paying attention to what I was saying until I said, The Drevlians took Igor to a sacred grove of theirs where blood adorned the trees. It was the blood of men whom they sacrificed to their gods. The Chechen's eyes turned to me, slightly widened and I told him, Legends say Igor had those same eyes you have right now when he saw the two bent birch trees in front of him as he was being led to his final resting place. He looked to his left to see a birch tree standing in front of him, and he shot a glance back to me. His eyes were a clear indicator of what was on his mind. He was scared. The Chechen sniper who took so many lives was afraid of dying. That's when Sasha, who was seated in the driver's seat, pressed on the gas pedal a little, causing the ropes to tighten around the specter's body. The realization that he could be pulled apart then and there sent the man into a panic. He started begging for me to shoot him in heavily accented Russian. In response to his begging, I shot back at my fellow soldiers and asked, Do you guys know what the Drevlians shouted at Igor when he was begging for his life after they tied him between the two bent birch trees in a Kievan accent? The boys behind me began screaming out like wild animals, Foreigner! 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 I grabbed the man by the back of his neck and leaned against him, telling him, They called him a foreigner. They berated him for not being a native of their lands, and just before releasing the two birches to tear Igor's body apart, Prince Mal told him about how he was going to fuck the shit out of his wife and take over his realm. I let go of the man and looked at the car behind me. Sasha was smiling like a madman, pressing ever so slightly on the gas pedal. I found that moment to be funny, and so I laughed telling the Chechen, after they let the birches tear Igor in half, Mal had his men collect whatever remains of the Kievan's body and send it to his wife, Olga, to teach her who was in charge of these lands. Maybe we should send your mother your remains just to show her who is in charge here, huh, Spectre? The man's pleadings had gotten louder and sloppier. I could hear him sob. The quivering in his voice sounded amusing to me back then. I turned to face him again and asked quietly, Hey guys, should we send his guts to his mother? The boys behind me erupted in cheers, and I simply stared at the man whose life lay in my mercy. Not batting an eye, I roared, Sanya, tear him in half! The sounds of a car engine running at full force filled my ears, as all I could see was the slow exposure of the Chechen's viscera. I could see him scream the whole time, as his clothes and skin slowly expanded to the breaking point. A second after I saw blood, I could see a mountain of red and moist gut matter peeping through the gapes in his torso. A second later, his lower half was torn out of place. As Sasha flew a few meters forward with the car, 
The ground between the Chechen, who somehow did not die immediately after losing half of his body, and the car were covered in blood, guts, and some other internal organs, like his liver that just fell out of him. I looked at the somehow still barely breathing Chechen, and mockingly said in a forced Caucasian accent, Now you are a real spectre. The boys laughed at my remark, and we just left the scene. We got back to our posts just before dawn. No one came to question us about disappearing for a few hours during the night. No one seemed to be bothered, even though it was pretty evident that even the officers knew. I wasn't really bothered by any of this until recently, when I heard about how my youngest son was saying he wanted to be a soldier to kill all the bad guys like his father. That got me thinking, were we really the good guys in this conflict? After some soul-searching... I have come to the conclusion that regardless of who was what, I was certainly a monster at a few points back there. To be honest, right now that my kids are so proud of my military background, this notion is killing me. I don't want any of my kids to end up a cold-blooded killer like me, looking out of the window at my innocent son, who seems to be having so much fun on his swing between the two birches. I would hate to see his hands get soiled with the blood of another. They all died on the dead mountain. What an odd way to start a journal entry. Then again, it's kind of badass. They all died on a dead mountain. That really comes off like the beginning of some western where the lead character is some grizzled old cowboy who talks about his kill count. Fuck. I'm not writing this for the sake of my own gratification, obviously. Doctor said that letting all of my negative crap and putting it on paper is a good way to cope. I don't know. It kind of helps, but still kind of doesn't. That's why I rarely do it. Ah, well. Anyway, back to why I'm even writing this whole thing down right now. They all died on the dead mountain. I would say we all did, but that would be a lie. I am alive, and David is alive too. I could say our souls died there, but that would be a lie as well. These have died way before. I've met David back during my service, and it turns out this Georgian hard man didn't live far away from me, and we apparently share the same love for nature exploration. I suppose our military experience is what ensured our survival. I digress. My story might sound like some crazy conspiracy theory or some bullshit tale to anyone who might read it, if ever, but it's not. I went to Dyatlov's Pass with nine other people, and eight of them died. Ironically, they died probably the same way the infamous expedition had died so many years before us. As far as I'm concerned, only one person died because of extraordinary circumstances, and to be perfectly honest... I'm not sure about that either. Something killed Andrei Belkin, a creature. But I wouldn't call it a supernatural creature. It was probably some sort of bear species or something. I hope it was one of those. Ugh, I do have to mention something that might make a conspiracy theorist or the supernatural enthusiast drool all over themselves, however. Once we left Vijay, the last settlement before our destination, the atmosphere in the area felt kind of weird. It's like the air was kind of heavy and cold. Not the type of cold you get in cold weather, but as if everything was devoid of life. If I had to compare it to anything, it's like the aftermath of a battle on a battlefield. Everything is so cold and dead, and nothing feels exactly right. It's like you're on another plane of existence. Like, ugh, I don't even know how to put this. Now, maybe it's just the northern climate that made me feel this way, but I don't really know. There was this one moment when we reached the foot of the Holochal, during which everyone just kind of froze for a moment. We had this collective lapse in thought, and we just stopped, looked at each other with confused looks in our eyes. I remember saying that we all just must be still half asleep since this was the early morning, and just like that we just carried on with our trip. I don't recall experiencing that feeling ever again. 
Maybe we were just being collectively tired or maybe not. I don't really know. For all I know, maybe this thing is just part of my imagination. I tend to get that from time to time. Not very pleasant to hear bombs going off where there are none. Regardless, I went to Holochal for the sake of an alpine hike. I wasn't there to explore the deaths of Dyatlov's expedition. I couldn't care less about that. I was there to explore the nature of the Komi Republic. Going out in the middle of the winter was probably the bad part of that idea. Now that I think about it, our troop and Dyatlov's troop share a bunch of similarities. Both groups had climbed on top of the dead mountain and couldn't really go anywhere else due to worsening weather conditions. Two, both groups probably experienced the same rare weather phenomenon. And both groups ended up losing people to the dead mountain. It's named so in the Mansi language due to the lack of animal life on the mountain. Later translations of the name came to be Dead Men's Mountain due to the incident with Dyatlov's expedition. I'm definitely rambling way too much here. Anyway, the trip was meant to be a three-week expedition around the Stone Belt Range of the Northern Komi Republic. It involved ten people. Andrei Belkin, Maxim Petrenko, Viktor Viliki, Alexander Shura, Semyonov, Pavel Pasha, Daronin, Vladimir Vova, Karyakin, Albert Slesorenko, Aslan Kabibolov, David Dado Ivanashvili, and me, Simeon Sioma Voronin. So the ten of us reached the top of the Holochal right before a bad snowstorm began, forcing us to camp on the slope of the mountain. We quickly set up the camp, and as it was getting late, opted to go to sleep, knowing full well how hard it is going to be to make our way through all the excess snow. We were all pretty tired, so sleep came easily. But I was awoken by the sound of moaning winds outside some time later. My sleep is pretty awful. I'll admit to that. I'm the lightest sleeper ever, probably. The moaning winds outside were so loud and violent they sounded like exaggerated ghosts wailing from the cartoons. I tried going back to sleep but the violent shifting of air outside of my tent made it virtually impossible for me to fall asleep. So I ended up tossing and turning in my sleeping bag. As time wore on, I felt myself getting visibly agitated by the weather and my inability to fall asleep. At one point, I started visualizing these cartoonish animated bedsheets walking around my tent, moaning and wailing, while creepily elated smiles were smeared on the lower part of their faces. My own thoughts made me shudder in discomfort. Little did I know. I was beginning to panic. Being used to this sort of feeling, I kept myself in check. I can't say the same for the other guys, however, as I was trying to calm my sprinting thoughts. I heard someone screaming inside the tent. I shot up and saw Vova jumping out of his sleeping bag, screaming for everyone to wake up. He was visibly shaken by something the rest of us couldn't see. His body was covered in a cold sweat, and he was shaking nervously. He started shaking everyone awake and whispering about something lurking outside. Tears were welling up in his eyes, but it wasn't fear. He was having a full-blown panic attack. When the guys were all awake enough to realize what was going on, they started showing signs of discomfort and anxiety as well. Go back to bed, you cunts! It's the wind! Dardo shouted at the boys as he turned in his sleeping bags. The wind? Nah! Something is out there fucking with us, Dardo, Pasha retorted. What is fucking with us? The natives. There are no animals here. It's the fucking wind, Dardo answered again. Bro, it can't be. Can't be. The wind. Victor, who was usually overconfident, stuttered. I began laughing. It hit me. My own anxiety and loopy thoughts were a result of the infrasound created by the winds outside. It was probably a Carmen Vortex street, raging out there, producing infrasound. It's this sort of vortex thing, I forgot the name. It produces infrasound that causes you to hallucinate and shit. Yeah, listen to Sioma. 
He knows his shit, Dado blurted out in an agitated tone. Just wear your goggles and plug your eyes to not feel the effects and go back to fucking sleep, he continued. What if it's not that, Andre sheepishly remarked. Dado shot up. Belkin, this isn't one of your videos, dude. There are no monsters in the real world. Cover your eyes and ears and go back to sleep. Itchaki, we didn't like this side of Andre. He was making YouTube videos considering various conspiracy theories, urban legends, and the like. That was fine if he only kept it to himself. But the guy began to believe in all that bullshit. Coupled with his whiny, high-toned voice and the occasional smart-ass attitude, he wasn't the most well-liked guy in our group. Yeah, it's probably the ghosts of Dyatlov's troop trying to scare us into leaving their resting place, Dado remarked sarcastically. I burst out laughing. No one else did. They were visibly terrified of something neither David nor I could see or comprehend for that matter. I could see in his demeanour that the wind was affecting him too, but he was used to hiding his internal storms just like me. He laid back down into his sleeping bag and remarked, Don't tear the tent apart if you're going to run away from the menks outside and try to find a heroic prince to save you princesses. Okay? We all fell silent after that as Dado laid down again. Nobody had spoken. We just sat there in silence as the winds outside moaned and groaned. All eyes were seemingly focused on me. They were widened with terror and bloodshot from the lack of sleep. I began feeling my skin crawl as everyone's eyes were seemingly focused on me. I felt as if they were staring straight into my soul, like a pack of hungry animals salivating at the prospect of pouncing on their helpless, favourite prey animal. I felt my heartbeat rising, even more than before. Chills ran down my spine as my body simmered. A cold drop of sweat developed at the top of my head and slowly made its way down my forehead and then across my face. But I did not dare to move. I was fixated on the malicious stares directed at me. This awkward situation lasted about a second all in all. But in my panicked state, it felt like hours had passed. The faces of my mates began contorting and twisting into impossibly wide smiles and vile expressions of what I can only describe as sadistic joy. Sadistic joy at the expense of my fear. I felt as if my heart was going to explode out of my ribcage and paint the whole tent with my blood. The moment my ears were filled with some sort of unintelligible whispering, I knew something was wrong. I blinked, and my mates just sat there in front of me, staring into space, consumed by anxious thoughts. I blinked again, and their heads turned to me, producing a sickening, crunching sound as their necks twisted and turned in my direction. Their faces were plastered with these disgusting, clownish expressions of morbid delight as the whispering in my ears turned into muffled chanting. I have blinked yet again, and they were back to their normal selves. I clenched my eyes shut as I began breathing deeply, trying to calm my rampaging nervous system. The infrasound was causing me to hallucinate. Four breaths in, and I felt two frigid bony claws land on my shoulders, sending shivers all over my back and arms. That's not real. It's just in your mind, I told myself. Thud. Something crashed, producing a loud thumping sound, one so loud it even drowned the moaning of the vortex outside. It was so loud all of us were startled. The guys began getting up and talking about something. I didn't pay enough attention to notice what they were saying. I was focused on the storm raging inside of my mind. Everything outside sounded so meek and muffled. I could make out one of the guys saying, it's just the snow, but I've no idea whom it was. By the time I felt I was calm enough to notice what was going on, most of the guys left the tent. So, 
I shook myself out of my self-imposed meditative trance to notice that the tent was mostly empty, with Dado laying in his sleeping bag, his eyes and ears covered. He was already asleep, and Andre was making his way out of the tent. He was barely dressed. I got up from my sleeping bag as he was making his way out. The fuck you're going like that, man? He didn't respond. Andre! I called out as I ran towards the tent's entrance. Belkin, where are you going? Hey, dude, wait a moment. Nothing. He just ran outside without even turning back to me. For a moment, I thought I'm hallucinating all over again, so I went to Dado and shook him awake. He removed his ear flaps and mumbled, Sup? Dude, did they all just leave or am I losing my shit? I croaked. He sat up, removing his goggles and wiping his eyes before looking around our shelter. Shit, he mumbled to himself. The realization sank in. They all ran out. Most of them were poorly dressed. Gotta get to them before they freeze to death, I said. Aha. Uh -huh. David was already ahead of me, putting on an extra layer of pants on top of his pajama trousers. We dressed as quickly as we could and ran out of the tent, hoping to see any one of the guys before it was too late. Looking around frantically, we screamed the names of our mates, but no answer came. We started looking for some sort of a clue. Something. Some sort of sign. Maybe even a human shadow. It took us almost thirty minutes to find footprints. We had followed the prints for a couple of hundred meters before they were completely covered by the heavy snowfall. Fucking hell! I angrily shouted out. Dado was laughing his ass off at something. What? What's so funny now? Fucking Dyatlov's Pass. What a wretched place. Ha ha ha. Dado, you're sick, brother. You and me both, Sioma. You and me both, he chuckled. That's when he stopped and pointed his finger up in the air. Did you notice that? He asked me. The shadow? Something ran not far behind us, casting an oddly shaped shadow. We slowly turned around and started walking east. After a few minutes of walking, we were startled by some sort of whooping laughter, something similar to a hyena but not quite it. The fuck? I blurted out. David pressed his finger to his mouth gesturing me to remain quiet, and then he pointed to the left. Following his finger, I saw Andre walking towards something, something that looked like a four-legged statue. I nodded, and we quietly made our way towards Andre. He was quite a distance away from us, but we knew we could at least reach him and get him back to the tent and tend to him before something goes wrong. Fifteen seconds after we started sprinting towards him, I could finally make out that thing he was walking towards. It wasn't a statue. It was a thing. Some sort of animal. It looked like this emaciated bear thing with a terribly long grey fur dangling from its skinny frame. It looked like it was part of the snowstorm. I tapped on David's shoulder and gestured him with my hands an F-bomb referring to the sight in front of us. His eyes widened, and he began running towards Andre and the beast. I picked up my pace, too. When we were a few yards behind Andre, we both shouted at the top of our lungs while still maintaining a safe distance. Run! Run, Belkin! Run the fuck away! The beast stared at us before releasing a paralyzing screech that sounded like a mix between the calls of a red-tailed hawk and the sounds emitted by a tire violently scraping against asphalt. It was so loud we both stopped and fell to our knees because the thing wouldn't stop screeching. I felt like my brain was about to explode at any moment if this thing wouldn't stop. As I sat there clutching at my ears, screaming in agony, I felt something hit me from behind. The force of the blow was so powerful, I felt myself fly a few feet into the air before landing roughly on the frozen ground below me. Everything was blurry for a few moments once I hit the ground, and then I blacked out. I doubt I'd be sound enough to even write this if it weren't for the impact of the landing on my head. 
What I've seen during these few short moments was probably worse than seeing a person getting blown up to bits, and I've seen that. Unfortunately, I did that to someone. When you're blown apart by a grenade, you don't get the displeasure of feeling pain. It's just way too quick. A nanosecond passes and everything is over. You're dead. As much as I didn't like Belkin, it points. The poor guy didn't have the pleasure of going out fast enough to not feel a single thing. While his death was fairly quick, he probably felt a moment or two of hellish pain. Anyway, in these few short moments before I was out, though, I've seen what happened to Andre Belkin. Four of these animals ran up to him and tore him apart like a paper doll, spilling his blood and viscera all over the snow. His death was a quick one. They had torn him apart completely. Nobody survives that. Not to mention how one of these things grabbed him by the neck and tore his head off. He had probably been dead before he even got to feel most of the pain, and even the little that he did feel probably felt worse than anything I could handle. Ugh. Just thinking about it makes me feel sick to my stomach. That's why I have never told anyone about that until now. You know, when you kill for the first time, you're so nervous and shaken and disgusted, and everything just kind of spins around you, and everything is so weird and confusing and ugh, I can't even put that feeling into words. It's something like being thrown into super cold water or going on the craziest roller coaster ever, but not in a good sense. It's just like everything you knew just goes to shit. And it's not a feeling you are going to feel ever again. Because eventually, we humans get used to killing en masse if we need to. You feel like you're a changed person. Like you see things in a different light. But that's a fleeting feeling. Eventually, everything becomes a routine. Yeah, things back home for people like me become different. But eventually, it's all the same. You're the same piece of organic waste. And you're the same person. With more shit on your plate. That's all. Ugh. Fuck. I'm rambling. I guess that's a coping mechanism. I guess remembering Belkin's death felt just like the first time I had to put a bullet into someone. And I don't like feeling that. Anyway, I was awoken by David some time later, and we were all alone in the snow. No Andre Belkin. No monsters. No blood. Nothing. We didn't speak about what took him. We just avoided this conversation ever since. I gather that Dado didn't try to fight these things away from Belkin. He knew he had no chance against them. I don't blame him, really. We looked around for the other guys for some time, and when the sun began rising, and we hadn't found anyone, we made our way back to the camp, and from there we got back to Vijay. A search party was organized once we've explained the incident to the locals. It included me and Dado. We ended up finding the bodies of everyone. Took us a few weeks to get to Shura and Max, because they somehow ended up on the other side of the mountain, covered in the aftermath of a minor landslide. Everyone was found. Everyone but Andre Belkin. Turns out Slesarenko's backpack was found a hundred meters from where his body rested. No clue why he took it with him when they all ran out, but then again he had a flashlight and about a million batteries in there. His journal was there too. He liked writing stuff down. It's fucking shameful he had to go so early. The man was a brilliant mind. What a fucking waste. Shit. I hate this. I hate this so fucking much. God. We let one of the search party members keep his diary. A lovely lady. She was so why not. Said she'll spread our story for us. Ah, Jesus. I'm digressing again. Dado and I know exactly what happened to him. To Belkin, that is. My thoughts are all over the place. Fucking hell. On my last night at Vijay, I took a hike in the town. I was just thinking about all that had happened and how this could have been prevented if only they listened. Or rather, if we tried to convince them a little harder to protect their sensory organs. 
Anyway, as I was walking around, snow began blowing again, and a burst of familiar laughter rolled in the distance, making me freeze in place. I turned slowly to the source of the diabolical vocalizations and saw it. It was standing showered in the moonlight. This wretched beast stood in front of me and stared right into my core. I could finally make out its shape properly. The beast had a thin frame coated by a heavy grey fur coat hanging from its emaciated body. Everything was pretty much covered up by the coat, and if it weren't for the wind that blew apart the tense coating of the creature, I wouldn't be able to see its skeletal frame. After a few moments of staring at each other, a gust of wind finally blew the patch of fur covering the beast's head apart, revealing its disgusting dolphin-like mug. Our eyes locked for but a second. Its white eyeballs stared at me unblinking, making me feel almost physically ill as it let out its laughing calls. Then the beast turned around and walked away, fading into the snow. A wave of discomfort washed all over me, making me shudder. That made me realize that perhaps it wasn't the wind on top of Holachal that caused all of this. Maybe it was the fault of these things that live in Dyatlov's Pass. Perhaps these are the menks that the Mansi myths speak of. But I do hope this is just some sort of crazy, undiscovered bear species. I can't know for sure, but what I do know for certain is this was the reason at least one man died on the dead mountain. Did writing this down help me? Absolutely not. I still think I have a part in their deaths. And quite frankly, the memories made me feel sick. I'm going to stop now before I blow up again. God damn this. God damn every single thing about this. I'm done with this sort of shit. What's with that look in your eyes, love? You know I've always disliked seeing you like this, ever since the first time I've seen this scared stare form upon your face when I asked you to jump with me from a twenty-foot cliff into the waters of the Mediterranean with me back when we were kids. It's kind of funny you give me that look now, you know, because you were always relatively fearless. You were always a fearless girl, even the last time I saw you. You were smiling at a time that would make most people fear and wail, but you were smiling and laughing. Up until a few months ago, I would have been the one with a mortified look in my eyes. This is funny, you know, the irony of this all. I do feel somewhat bad for talking to you only now. You were my best friend. You were like family to me, love. And how do I repay you? I completely lost my shit and tried to ignore you when you've decided to visit. I'm a terrible friend, aren't I? I'm truly sorry for being such a douche to you. If only you could be so kind to forgive me. Please forgive me for all the wrongs that I've done to you and for those I'm still about to do. As a penance, I'll let you know some things that might make you a little happier, all right? So, where do I start? First off, the day you left, your twin sister admitted to loving me just as much as you do. You and I both knew this long before she could bring it up. I mean, there had to be a reason for her chasing us around all the time, hadn't there? Your younger sister, this girl, and, well, she kind of took your spot in my life. She is a spitting image of you, both in appearance, even though you two always had different hair colors and in personality. She's so much like you that she's just the right amount of sarcastic and cynical, just like you. Hell, she even grits her teeth like you when she's really mad about something. Many things have changed in the time that you were gone. I've been in a relationship with this one girl for three years, but I had to end it. I'm fine, though. If you're worried, which you do seem to be, I've met new friends. I've found old friends again, and lost some to the harsh realities of life. Audan died in a car crash. Do you remember Audan? You were pretty close with him too. We all were. I have had to serve in the military too. It wasn't bad. Quite enjoyable at times. So many things happened. So many people came and went. 
and only the memory of you had remained a constant in my mind. I cried so much on the day you've left. I'm pretty sure I almost dehydrated myself due to the amount of crying. But I wasn't depressed. Does this make you happy? You were the one to tell me that I should be optimistic, and that everything that happens in this world is for the better. I sure hope it does make you happy, because that would mean that you're not only afraid right now, but at least a little joyous. I wish I could see the beautiful smile of yours just one more time. Your smiles always lightened up my spirit. You always knew that too, and enjoyed this little fact. Smile for me. Just once. Please. I'm so tired of this terrified look on your face. Smile. Just once more. If you can. Do tell me. Is it this rope I'm holding that scares you? If so, you shouldn't worry so much. It's just a prop for an act a few friends and I are putting up today. I am attending an acting school right now. You know? Someone had inspired me to try out acting. Apparently, I have some flair for the dramatics. Well, how couldn't I have with whatever storm is inside that mind of mine? I'm about to disappoint you, though. At some point, I broke mentally. I don't even know why. It just happened all of a sudden, and I was struck down by a depressive episode. You know they say depression isn't sadness, but rather a sense of apathy towards life. They're wrong. Depression is like a monster that tries to kill you with numbness. It is just this bad. Don't worry, though. I wasn't suicidal or anything. I just felt empty and void of purpose. Nothing I couldn't handle. It did make me neglect all of my friends and grow distant from everyone who knew me. I avoided unnecessary human contact for a few months. I just didn't want to be around people if I hadn't had to be around them. When my depressive episode began wearing off and I started socialising again, people began telling me I'm somewhat incoherent and random in my speech. I had dismissed them at first, figuring I might have started messing up my words because I started using three languages at once for communication. This wouldn't stop happening. People would constantly ask me to repeat myself and what I was meaning. Soon enough, I had figured it was just their way of getting back at me for leaving them. It had to be, hadn't it? I mean, if the ones you love randomly leave you without explanation, wouldn't you be mad at them, even for a bit? It's at moments like this I wish you would have been able to speak, or at least chose to, instead of just staring at me. We were best friends, so why don't you ever talk any more? You just show up, stare at me and then leave again, all without saying a word. Anyhow, since people never stopped complaining about my speech patterns, I had concluded that they are just trying to laugh at my expense. So I've stopped speaking to most of them again. Those whom I've chosen to maintain contact with did not mention that anything is wrong with my speech anymore. I don't know if I pissed someone off or anything, but for the longest time, it seemed like people who were walking behind me had the intention of hurting me. They all just seemed too malevolent to be random pedestrians, especially at night. I don't seem like easy prey. I hope, Marjotus, I will admit that I was scared at times, genuinely scared. I still am at points. It is a shame you weren't here then to comfort me, love. I wished for you to be here then. I did. All of this had led to constant stress, anxiety, and dread. You know what the best part about all of these is? It takes a huge toll on your body. My sleep was almost non-existent. My rejuvenating sleep was most definitely gone. And my shoulders would constantly burn with the pain of being too tense for too long. Moreover, you know what's funny? This wasn't even the worst part. Oh no. That. Was not. It all started with random sensations of touch on my back and shoulders. I discarded these as the result of the constant stress that had consumed my whole life. The touch sensations were accompanied by random goosebumps. I mean, this could happen to a stressed person, right? 
I could even discard the random movements in the corners of my eyes and the sensation of having someone behind me as the result of a prolonged lack of good sleep. Here's the thing, though. I could not make any sense of you being here. The first time you appeared to me, I spun my chair while waiting for my movie to load on the computer. There you stood, next to my closet, dressed in pajamas, with your slightly faded blonde hair covering most of your emaciated face. You looked exactly the same as the day I last saw you, slightly crouched from the constant pain that came with your breathing. Your eyes still somewhat sunken from all the weight you had lost during your time with tuberculosis, even though your hair was obscuring the majority of your facial features. I could see your dark blue eyes, devoid of emotion. You just stared a hole through me, and I literally fell off my seat. Do you remember that? I clearly do. I screamed at the top of my lungs, trying to convince myself that my eyes were lying to me. I clearly knew they were lying to me. You couldn't be here. You still can't. I saw your dead body on the morning of your death back at the hospital. You had died in your sleep, the doctors concluded. After so much pain and suffering, your body gave out. The tuberculosis had beaten you to a pulp. I was there when they placed you in the ground. I kissed your bones one last time before the burial worker had taken you away from this world and sent you on your journey to the next one. You couldn't be real. You still can't be. You wouldn't let me go, though. You kept showing up, devoid of any emotion, looking like you did on the day of your bloody death, staring a hole through me. You showed up day in and day out. You were making me lose my mind, love. You were killing off my sanity. You probably remember all of that. I'm sure you do. Do you remember how you made me snap a few weeks ago? Do you remember how I flipped every last piece of furniture and destroyed anything I could that day because of you? Well, even then, you still showed no emotions. You were just trying to erase my sanity. This is so funny, you know. I mean, my best friend was basically trying to lead me to my grave, but it was a neighbor of mine who ended up finding me in shattered pieces. It was just a neighbor who took me to the hospital. It was just a neighbor who saved my life. Can you guess why it is so funny? Because we aren't even close with the man. So why do you sport that scared look now, dear? Oh, I know. It's the pills that my therapist got me prescribed to, isn't it? I can tell you're no ghost. Pills do not kill ghosts. Whatever kind of broken mechanism you are inside of my skull, that look on your face tells me exactly how this part of my brain feels about these antipsychotic pills. I'm sorry, love, but you're going to die again. This time, though, you're not going to die with a little smile on your face. No, you're going to be erased out of existence with a mortified stare permanently etched into your mug. Schizophrenia can be a bitch.